A home is a lot of work. Just plain work. When work at home is planned and organized for cooperation, there can usually be more time for leisure. I'm certainly in favor of those things. Leisure, fun. Who is it? Wouldn't we all be happier if we worked out a little system for living together in harmony? But how can we manage them? We'll have to work out the full answer together. Say, Mom, it's well. Family problems can be solved through frank and friendly discussion, which points the way to a happy family life. You know, this is beginning to be quite a family project. It certainly is. Amen. Welcome, everybody. We are so glad you're here. We are talking about imperfect families, and, and we're not trying to be perfect, but we recognize that we need to grow and learn and, and blossom, and I just want to give a big shout out and welcome to everybody who's watching online. Last Sunday, everybody watched online, and uh, so, so thankful for our production team and all that they do to keep us up and running. Well, as we talk about imperfect families, today, in today's message, we want to share a message, and I'm so glad to have my wife, Kim, sharing with me today. Would you give her a big shout out? Yes. Thank you. Too many times, our relationships, we tend to exist versus being intentional. And we we take the approach of hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil. And, And that's just kind of the way we approach our family relationships. Well, today we want to talk about the family code of honor. If you're here and you say, or you're watching online, you say, that sounds familiar. That means you've been a part of Rock Family Church longer than four years because it's been four years ago that we ministered this message. But I want to give you a little backstory to where this message came from and why we share it about every three to five years. In 2000, Kim and I moved here with our family from Tulsa and relocated here to the Springs. And when we did, one of the young ladies from our youth group was accepted at the United States Air Force Academy. And so for her four years here, we kind of became her Colorado Springs mom and dad. And we'd have her over and and just, you know, just loved on her. Well, it was very insightful to learn about our Air Force Academy, of which I knew nothing about. But one of the things that intrigued me the most was the code of honor. And that if you broke the code of honor, you could be kicked out of the school. And it was simply this. We will not lie, steal, or cheat, nor tolerate anyone among us who does so. And I, and I, I said to her, I said, Christina, what is that like? And, and, and man, that must really be cool if you know no one will lie, no one will cheat, no one will steal. And she said, well, it works most of the time and, and, and so forth. But in the middle of this season of life, I've got to take you back a few decades, Kim and I were the parents of about an 11-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a 7-year-old, and that is us many moons ago in the middle of our family. And it was in 2001 that I began to ask the question, what does it mean to be a Christian family? We talk about the Bible, we say we want to we practice the Bible, but What would be the code of honor that I would want our marriage to function by, I want our family relationships to function by, and that's how I wrote the family code of honor. But I don't know about you, but in the family code of honor or any, I don't really want a list of rules of a bunch of don'ts. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. For me, that's not motivating. Right. So tell me the do's. So you'll notice we have 10, and if you have your note page, we have 10, but they're all do's. And this is a prescription of health for your family. This doesn't matter whether it's just Dean and I are empty nesters. This doesn't matter whether it's just um, you and a roommates. This doesn't matter if you live alone, but we all inter, you know, come in contact, well, we hope we do, with other people, right? If you go to the office, you have those people, you have siblings, even if they live across the country, you can, you can use these, this code of honor in any of your relationships. Actually, after first service, we had someone come up and say, 
my husband and I and their empty nesters, and they said, we have had this on the refrigerator for four years. For four years. They said, oh, I'm so glad to get a new copy of, of this today because it's got like, you know, coffee stains on it and all of that. They said they read it at least five times a week. They read through this family code of honor. So wherever you are, I hope that this will help you because this is a prescription. Now, if you had been in an accident, car accident, and let's say you couldn't move from the waist down, your legs weren't working, but the doctor said, if you will take this prescription four times a day, we've seen that you will get movement back. You'll get feeling back in your legs. I'm sure many of you'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, I will take that prescription, right? Four times a day is what I need to do. Well, this is a prescription for your family. But what if you only took the prescription two times a day? You know, four times is a lot to remember, right? So what if you only took it two times a day? What I'm going to tell you is be all in. Don't just do half of it. Be all in. Make the difference. Um, I will also tell you that you can improve any relationship today by 50% because you can improve you and your portion of the relationship. I've also had people say, well, what happens if I live with someone who's an unbeliever or one of my roommates or whatever? We're not talking about them. This is about you. This is about you being better and you improving and those relationships, especially family relationships, but any relationship can improve. So if I only take two pills a day and I don't get better and I go back to the doctor and I say, hey, this miracle drug that you gave me to rejuvenate my spinal cord isn't working. He said, well, have you taken four, four pills a day every six hours like I told you to? Well, I tried. Sometimes I did. Sometimes I got one. One, one day I got four. Whose fault is it that you're not healthier and better? Whose fault is it that you're still handicapped? The pharmaceutical company? The doctor? No, we'd have to own that responsibility. And many times what happens in our relationships is our relationships are handicapped because we don't apply the truth of God's word into our relationships. Right. And we have the gospel prescription that we need to take don't laugh at that it works <laughs> all right and when we take God's prescription we end up with healthier marriages and relationships Amen. all right let's get into it real quick we want to go through these 10 we want to help you uh, grow in this family code of honor number one we daily pursue a growing relationship with Jesus Christ individually and as a family now, I'm just going to tell you, we could stop right there almost and not give you the other nine. Because the way I become a better husband is when I become more like Jesus, I become more lovable, huggable to her. When I am selfish and angry and bitter, this is just an example's sake only. Yeah. If I am... If yeah. I am angry and carnal and want my own way and I want to go where I want to eat and I want to do what I want to do, the marriage is going to struggle. But Jesus said, I came to serve, not be served. Jesus came and he humbled himself at the cross. When I take on the characteristics and attributes of Jesus, she be, I become a better husband, she becomes a better wife, you become a better son or daughter, mom or dad. Jesus said, seek first, in Matthew chapter 6, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So we don't necessarily seek a better marriage, we seek to know him. Right. We don't seek to become a better dad or mom, the more we know Jesus, the better, we be, the better mom or dad we become. And so John chapter 14 and verse 15 says, if you love me, obey my commandments. Now, one of the things that happens in Christianity is we try and do the law. Well, the Bible says you should do this, you should don't do that, do this, don't do that. And we get all caught up in the works, don't do this, do that, versus Jesus said, love me. And here's what I found. The more I fall in love with Jesus, the more my life aligns like his. Amen. And I'm not trying to do something or trying to be something just by association I become more like him and on your notes the next point is the higher we go in our walk with God we suffocate the sin nature 
Who better can understand this than people that look at Pikes Peak every, every day, every morning and every evening, and we see the tree line. The trees can't grow above about 10,000, about 11,000 feet. Why? There's not enough oxygen. And the higher we go in our walk with Jesus, we suffocate the sinful, carnal, selfish nature. Amen. All right. Yours well, Joshua said, let me get Joshua in okay. there. Joshua right. said this, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. All right. Number two, we walk in love by displaying words, actions, and attitudes of love. Yes. Look at John 13, 34. It says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I've loved you. You should love each other. So all the old, the Ten Commandments that maybe you memorized as a child or whatever, don't steal, don't kill, don't, right? It's saying, instead of all of those, really, here's just one. It's a new one. Yep. Love one another. So if I love you, I'm not going to covet. If I love you, I'm not going to steal. Right. If I love you. So what it's saying is, this is the new commandment. Here's the New Testament commandment. Also, 1 John 3, 18, it says, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Amen. Amen. Now, I can tell Dean I love him, but if I don't come home from work ever, I always just go out with my friends, come home just in time to sleep and get up and do it again. Or I tell him I love him, but I'm hateful. I'm argumentative. At some point, you got to go, dude, seriously. Right, Kim? you got to step it up here. It's not just about saying it with our mouth. It's about showing yes. our actions. Now, I want to demonstrate love by some dental floss. <laughs> if you take dental floss and put it around your finger and tie it really tight, it's going to get red, then purple. If you leave it and keep cinching it up, it's going to kind of turn an ashen gray color, Right? What I'm going to tell you is what's missing. Something is missing to the end of my finger. If I take it all off, it automatically comes back. It's the blood. It needs my finger, my body needs blood. The How life. important is that? And that is life. But what I want you to know is what blood is to the body, love is to your family relationships. What blood is to the body. So if you've got it cinched really tight on the area and it's starting to fall off, that relationship is starting to deteriorate, you need to go, I have got to put extra yeah. effort. I need to put some extra love into that. I need to analyze, what am I doing wrong here? Let blood flow back to that appendage. And then number three, we will daily pray for each family member. I don't want you to answer, and if you're at home, I don't want you to say it out loud. But if you were to really judge yourself, when is the last time you prayed beyond kind of a sneeze prayer? Kind of, God bless my family. God bless this food. You know what I'm saying? That you actually said, I'm going to intercede and pray for my husband or wife. I'm going to pray for my children. Children, you want to see transformation, your mom or dad? You don't like the way your mom or dad are treating you and things are going? Don't go whining to them. Take it to the Father. And, and, and begin to pray and begin to submit yourself to them, to the Lord, and let God deal with them. There's been many times as a parent that all of a sudden I was like, you know, I, I don't know what it is. I just sense, I just feel. I think my kids were praying. Dad's got a bad attitude. Dad said no before he thought about it, you know. And, as, and, and something on the inside convicted me that I should go to my kids and say, yes, I think you should go. Yes, it's okay that you attend that event or that situation. But too often we don't pray. And why don't we pray? We don't pray because we don't believe that our prayers will make a difference. We believe the lie of the enemy that Jesus, uh, that, that he says to us that our prayers won't make a difference. God doesn't listen to our prayers. You're, you can pray all you want till you're blue in the face, but it's not, nothing's going to change. And when we believe that lie, we say, why bother about prayer? We say, oh, I'll pray for you, brother. I'll pray for you, sister. And we never do. Why? Because we don't believe that our prayers make a difference. Jesus said the devil's a liar and the father of it, and there is no truth in him. And that he was a liar from the beginning, and, and he's, when he lies, he speaks his native language. 
And so let me help you understand how he lies to us. Now, Kim helps out with a lot of the decor and colors and paints and different things. And she said, I'm tired of the black back wall being black. We need to brighten things up. And I want it painted yellow. And she says, who will help me? And you are the only soul in the room that says, sure, Miss Kim, I'll do it. And you come up front after service, and she hands you a little yellow fine point Bic pen and says, go get him, tiger. Let me know when you're done. Now, we look at the size of the back wall, and this is how we feel in prayer. The devil says, you're not making a difference. Look at the size of that knee. How can you pray for Asia? How can you pray for Africa? You're just... But what does the word of God teach us? Look what James chapter 5 says. The earnest prayer of a righteous man has great power and wonderful results. Now, the word of God says when you pray, big things happen. Devil says when you pray, little things happen. God says when you pray, massive things happen. She wants that wall painted yellow. Give me a bucket, a big bucket. Foom, 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 foom. Let's go get tacos. Devil says when you pray, little things happen. God says when you pray, big things happen. A two-minute prayer could be life transforming. And so what do we say at the Hawk household? What I want you to say, I want you to know the family that prays together stays together. The family that prays together stays together. All right. Number four, our words are uplifting, encouraging. Here's the hard part. Okay. Ready for it? And spoken at conversation level, uplifting and encouraging. Your words can lift someone's morale. I can be in a bad mood and some sweet soul at the office can put on a real bright face and say something encouraging or uplifting to me. It can change the whole atmosphere, right? right? Encouraging words. I was talking to someone just this week and I said, here's the thing. I don't care whether it is your spouse, your child, your, your neighbor. Praise the behavior you want repeated. It sounds a little manipulative, but whatever works, okay? So praise the behavior you want repeated. I love it when you put the dishes in the dishwasher. I so appreciate that. What does that make him want to do? Do it again. And the fact that you roll that big old green canister all the way up. We have a long driveway, just so you know. All the way up the driveway and leave it once a week. Thank you for taking the trash out. But I'm going to tell you, it works with all humans regardless of the relationship, but it even works with my stupid little dog. Last night, Dean says the dog was chewing on something and he goes, bear, no, no, no bite. And the dog's tail goes down and he looks. He stopped biting. And he stopped, he stopped chewing. And then Dean ignored him a second and he looked back down and the dog, he said, good dog, good boy bear. And then his little tail goes, right? And he started chewing it again in a little while. And Dean said, no, no, bear, right? But then as soon as he stopped doing it, he praised the behavior that he wanted to repeat it. Remember that. All right, Ephesians 4.29. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Don't be critical. Yeah. Don't always be critical. You don't, you don't want to be known as that person. How would it change your conversation in your home if there was, all of our homes, right? Me too. If there was a speaker that sat on top of our house that broadcasted all the words. Ah! But it's not always <laughs> just the words. It's often, especially for women, I feel you. It's the for tone. Us, it's the tone. That's exactly right, you win. Okay, it's the tone. It's not just the words, it's the tone, right? Conversation level or a high volume, I'm just telling, as you elevate your voice, all you're doing is you're conveying anger. Yep. You're elevating others' emotions and anxiety and probably your own as well. 
but your tone can just be as important, like I said, as the words themselves. Because I will say that even when he can't hear, he'll say from the room, I'm talking, and then this is what he says. Okay, you understand that just the two of us live in the house. Okay, just setting the, setting the stage here. So he'll say from the other room, he'll say, if you're talking to me, I can't hear you if you can't see me. Okay, it's just the two of us, so I am talking to you. Well, no, some, wait. No, no, no. No, no, no. no I'm calling a timeout right here. Does your spouse do this? She's giving herself Siri, remind me at this. And then she's doing a talking oh, okay. text. And I'm like, are you talking to me? I, do you feel my pain, brother? Do you feel my pain? I talk to Siri better than I talk to you, though. <laughs> <laughs> that would be true. But <laughs> there we go. His voice gets so loud, it's like, so I've had to tell him, it sounds like you're frustrated with me. Well, he's really frustrated with himself, right? It's the whole situation. I can't hear or whatever. My eye roll is behind closed doors, so we're good. <laughs> All right. We choose to think the best, believe the best, and speak the best about one another. If you told me, probably about any staff member, we have such a great staff. If you said, hey, so-and-so did da-da-da, and they had a bad attitude, and they said this, I'd be like, man, that doesn't sound like right. them. That doesn't sound like Stephanie. I've never known Stephanie to do da -da -da, whatever you're saying, but, but I'll certainly check into that. I, right away, though, believed the best because yeah. that's not her character. I thought the best of her, right? Yeah. You need to do that with your family members. Amen. Believe the best. Speak the best Amen. about one another. Amen. Amen. All right, number five, we are truthful and honest. This has to be a code of conduct for our relationships. We have to be truthful and honest. And how amazing would it be if no one in our home ever told a lie? A white lie, a yellow lie, a red lie. I don't care what color of lie. Well, it was just a little one. A lie is a lie. Right. Okay? And if we will speak the truth, it is going to build healthy relationships. In Proverbs 12 and verse 22, it says, The Lord detests lying lips but he delights in those who tell the truth. On your notes, the foundation of any relationship is trust. We can only build trust when we are truthful. Here's the way I would say it. The wall of trust is built one brick at a time. It's laying one decision, one response, builds that wall. And what am I doing? I'm building a defense around my relationships. I'm guarding and I'm defending that we will speak in truth and honesty with each other. And that wall is built and that brings security. But the moment I tell a lie and it's discovered, that wall is kicked down and 10, 20, maybe 30 of these bricks fall. And then you say, well, just trust me again. One choice, one decision, right. one response at a time. Teenagers, that's why it always went better in our home when I said, Did, what really happened there? Okay, Dad, I was lying. And, and, and if you will fess up and bring the truth, I'm telling you, we praise that behavior. We value that behavior because now we know we're having open and honest communication with one another. All right. Number six, we honor and respect each person, their possessions, and their privacy. We honor and respect each person, their possessions, and their privacy. Let me go into this. Start with Romans. Romans 12, 10, it says, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Yeah. There's a difference between honoring and obeying. Have you ever seen the, uh, there's a caption, a little cartoon of a girl sitting in a corner. She's like maybe seven years old or whatever. And there's a little bubble up above her head and it says, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside, right? <laughs> She's obeying, but honoring. Honor is a condition of the heart. That's right. So Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, it says, children, Obey your parents in the Lord because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Verse 2, it says, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. 
And last, it says, if you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on the earth. Students, I want you to know that if in life you have a very difficult time and you're always butting up against parents and against authority, I want you to know that there's not a lot of difference when someday you have an employer. Yeah. They're going to ask you to do things you don't want to do <laughs> or redo or redo or redo again <laughs> something, right? You're not going to agree with everything. So I'm just telling you, this is a life skill. And if I had been born back in the Bible times, I'd be dead because I think they stone you then if you disobey or disrespect right. your parents. So none of us would be here. But, but the key is in honoring. Right. It's that attitude of the heart. And when I honor, then I automatically obey. And if with your parents, you'll move from the obedience to the honor, it'll be so much easier when you have an employer. But let me tell you where else it'll be easier. For all of us, it'll be easier with our Heavenly Father. Yeah, that's to right. To go from I'm just obeying God to I'm honoring God. Yes. Because it's in my heart, right? That's good. So your possessions, we don't take or borrow without permission. I don't <laughs> know about you, but when I go to Target, they got stuff. It's their stuff. I don't borrow their stuff. <laughs> if I do and I walk out the front door, they don't say you need to stop borrowing that. They say you're stealing and call the cops on me. Okay? So, borrowing your stuff from your sibling only comes with permission. Yes. That's when you're borrowing. Take full responsibility for anything you break or misplace, can't find later on. That's a big one at our house. It's constant. It's a hoot. Um, even, even with our adult children, it's funny. Um, it's now totally a joke because, can I just tell it? Half the time, <laughs> half the time, seriously, probably more than half the time, we just forget where it is. So it's just easier to blame <laughs> them, even if they don't live there, you know? So, all right. Privacy. We knock before we enter a room. This may not be yours, right? You may break it down differently with your family. So, I'm, but I'm just telling you what we did. So a privacy was knock, knock, can I come in? Not knock, knock, Wah, I'm here, right? Privacy. Ah! <laughs> so, and there was that. Yeah, I can't get that image out of their heads. All right, let kids know, this is just us. Again, this is just us. For cell phones, for instance, maybe with your child, maybe you don't just pick up their cell phone and you read their text without their permission. Or spouse. Or spouse. But on the other hand, I will tell you, we have an open policy with each other. So there's not a code on a phone or a computer that he can't get into or know or look around or whatever. And that goes the same with me. He can go back and read text threads if he wants. We, that's just something that we have done. If you have an app on your phone that... Monitoring your kids. That monitors your kids. I mean, like, you know, they can't, like, go potty without you knowing. I don't know. I don't even know what all the apps do these days. But I would encourage you to talk to the kids and let them know. Oh, but I don't want them to know. Oh, no, no. You may actually stop some stuff is all I got to say. They may, they may actually think more than twice about that. They may think about four times before they do it because they're being monitored. I don't know. But I'm just saying that for us was we, we had that privacy, but we also told them what we could do. Seriously? We're so old, they didn't even have texting when our kids were growing up. And the ones that got cars, as they got cars, they got a cell phone. But you can't really talk on it. You can't, like, visit on it because that was way too much money. That's like $5 a minute or something. So you had to be dead and in the ditch before you called and used a minute or you owed me. I took it out of your allowance. So I didn't have quite the same problems that you do. But I hear both parents and teenagers alike say, they snoop in my room without my permission. Be sure to give that respect, and then it's yeah. easier to expect it. All right, last scripture here on this one. 1 Peter 2, 17. Respect everyone and love the family of believers. Fear God and respect the king. Amen. All right, number seven. We are kind, helpful, and supportive of each other. And all the mommies in the room said, Amen. 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 Woo-woo. Yes, put that one on the refrigerator. These three really do set the tone and the attitude and the atmosphere of a house. Yeah. Each house kind of has a feeling. Have you ever been into a home where you walked in and it's like, ah, it's tense, and no one's yelling or whatever, but you can just tell it's not comfortable, right? You can just tell, I want my house to be warm. 
I want to be kind and helpful. I want to exude that. I didn't ever want to buy furniture that someone felt like they couldn't put their feet up on it, because we do, right? Or it had to have a coaster. We try to use the coasters, but we don't always remember, right? It's more important to me for everyone to feel comfortable than for it to be perfect. But I want you to know that yesterday we were down south and we got hungry, and so um, we looked on Yelp. Do y'all do that? You look on Yelp, see where to go, and see what the ratings are, and all of that. And so Dean wanted to eat Mexican food. Shocker, I know, right? Woo. So we go to this place, had really good um, reviews and everything, kind of a mom and pop, kind of a dive place, which is often those are like the best. So we go in and we go up to the counter to order. It's one of those places, and we couldn't quite figure out whether we went to get the food or they brought it. But anyway, so we go up and we order, and this girl takes our order. Um, it was 60 degrees yesterday, and she wasn't happy to be there. That's all I got. Felt about say. 32 in the yeah, restaurant. Yeah, she was not. She, there was nothing she said that was wrong, right? right? But she, and so anyway, food was fine. But later last night, Dean says to me, he said, um, would you go back to that place to eat? I said, well, I don't think I would. I mean, it's a long ways. We don't are often down there. I said, I don't know that I would go regularly or even go out of my way to go. He said, did you like the food? I said, the food was fine. It's good. It was, it's okay. But we both said, but the person who took our order. And brought the food. And brought the food to us, right? She was, she was not happy to be there. So. This is, I know, just her place of employment. She did not give off a nice vibe, a warm vibe, is all I'm going to tell you. I will also tell you here at Rock Family Church, right. we have people who probably, they may go, I'm not sure I love that singing and, you know, preaching's okay, but man, people sure do love me. Right. People will actually return to a church. They just want to feel loved. It's so important. Yeah. So be helpful of each other. Set the right atmosphere here. Here's three scriptures that go along with this. First one is in Philippians. Philippians 2, 4. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. Amen. I mean, when I'm talking about serving, right, it's awesome to talk about have you had a great waitress or a great waiter? Then you're just, they're not in your face all the time, but they're just there to serve you. Do that with your family. Next, Proverbs 3, 27. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it's in your power to help them. When it's in your power to help them, you don't want to be known as a taker. Yes. Don't be selfish. Right. You want to be known as a giver. Yes. A giver of encouraging words. A giver of your time, of your talent. You want to be known as a giver. And last, Proverbs eleven twenty five: the generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Let me remind you of one other thing. I'm not sure why it is, but often when we're away from our home, we have really good manners. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> please. But sometimes when we're at home, we tend to not put that filter up and not do that. And I will tell you, if that's the only thing you hear today is to have good manners and love Jesus, <laughs> have good manners with those you're close to, right. with your family members. Yes. Don't treat them differently. You realize, I used to tell my kids this all the time when they would fight. It didn't always work, but I tried it. So they would, I would, they would fuss with each other, and I'd say, you realize that friend's going to come and go, but this is always going to be your brother. This is always going to be your sister. <laughs> I think they did the eye roll thing too, but whatever. Okay. All right, number eight, be quick to apologize and quick to forgive. If I cut myself and I'm maybe slicing some tomatoes and I got a little bit more than uh, uh, tomato and I got some finger, I'm not like... Oh, let's just, let's just let it rest a while and see if it'll get better. No, the, when you have, have a wound, the thing you want to do is to rectify that wrong as quick as you can. You want to resolve that issue as fast, and you want it to heal, and you want it to be made better as quick as possible. Well, too many times we ask our relatives that we want them to do time. We want to make them pay. We want to make them suffer for what they've done. When well, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32, it says, Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. And so what happens is that we need to be wise and we need to forgive the way we've been forgiven. Right. Can we think of some sins that we've done? 
But what happens is, is in, this, in this situation, in John chapter 20, Jesus made a brilliant statement. He says, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And so I'm going to use a sword as an offense. And let's say uh, after service, I'm in the lobby and I'm greeting people and it's your first Sunday and, and you walk up and you say, your church sucks. We're never coming back. You wounded me, all right? I'm the pastor. And your spouse overheard what you said to me. And he or she is like, honey, that was really mean. That was really offensive. You need to go apologize. Oh, I don't want to. You need to go apologize. So that person comes up and they say, hey, I'm sorry that I, what I said about your church. And they try and remove the offense. And here's what we think we do when we say, I'm not going to forgive you. We say, no, I'll never forgive you. We think we're injuring them. We're not injuring them. When we choose not to forgive, we're hurting ourselves. Right. I will never forgive you. And I can't heal until I remove the offense. Amen. But if I go around and I never forgive people, all of a sudden I've got wounds and I have offenses and I've got issues. And you ever had anybody that's a pain in the neck? And... <laughs> And the person who cut me off on 25, the person at the office, and then I come home and she goes, honey, you're home. And I'm like, back off, woman. I've had a rough day. <laughs> you're like a little voodoo doll, you know, that people have stuck things in. So what I have to do is I remove the offense and I say, I'm going to forgive them. Whether they ask you to or not. Whether they ask to or not. And what we think is, we think that if I forgive them, it's, it's it, that I'm giving permission for what they did. No, you're giving them, you're blocking the permission from them to continue to hurt and to wound you. Right. In Mark chapter, Mark chapter 11, here's a scripture for your refrigerator. But when you're praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Wow. That he's going to forgive on the level that we forgive. Amen. All right. So number nine, one of my favorites, we lay down electronics. I'm a, I'm a quality time girl. We lay down electronics and give one another quality and quantity of time. You can't spend two minutes with the kids and go, okay, this was quality. Zip for the week. No. Quality and quantity of time. Throughout the Gospels, we even see that Jesus retreated, and when he did, he spent time with his father, and he yep. spent time with his disciples, right? That was his family. He retreated and spent time with them. What is actual quality time? You'll have to ask your spouse or your child, what makes you feel loved when we spend time together? Well, I like it when we do this. Take your clues from them. Now, I like it as much as the next person going to the movies. I think I remember what a movie is. I do not remember what that popcorn tastes like, though it's been so long. But I do like going. But that does not check the box for me for quality time. That shoulder to shoulder and we're together and we were entertained, but it's not the same for me. She wants face to face time. Look I in do. my eyes. Talk to me. We even used to sit side by side. And now at dinner, he's learned he has to sit. He sits across. It's just it makes it, he can then check the box. So, um, Actual interaction, actual conversation, but also actual listening. Yes. So for us, this doesn't mean someone's in the same room. If you look at the amount of time we spend together, it's a wonder he still likes me. We're together a lot. But if you just call being under the same roof, it's not the same thing. And that doesn't substitute for that quality time. Right? Right? texting or being on the phone, just being in the same roof. Remember that. How much time do you spend with your kids? I looked it up. So we've got the British, average parent spends in the British just five hours face-to-face -face with their kids per week. There's 168 hours in a week. Woo. And they spend about five hours a week. So, okay, that's them. What about the U.S.? Okay. The U.S. American families spend just 37 minutes of quality time together per day. Now, that's 4.3 hours, I did the math for you, 4.3 hours a week, a little less, of the 168 hours per week. 
that may be different now that y'all are all homeschooling or have been. <laughs> Maybe you're ready to scale it down. But I just want you to know, we all have room for improvement on this, right? We all have room for improvement. But let's go back to our point of not just telling each other we love each other, but showing each other we love each other. And last on this point, Senator Paul Songus, he was diagnosed with cancer, and this is what he said, I've never met a man on his deathbed that wished he'd spent more time at work. Amen. Amen. All right, let's wrap this up. We're out of time. Number 10, we are stronger as a family than we are individually. What is the enemy trying to do? He tries to divide us. And what do we do? Just leave me alone. Just stay out of my room. And it's that isolation that he tries to get us alone because that's when he can attack. There is safety in a herd. And when our herd is our family. And Jesus said there's actually a spiritual power that takes place as well. In Matthew chapter 18, he said, I also tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gathered together as my followers, I am there among them. And so the greater our unity, the stronger we are. Where a lot of you guys are, are wrapped into the March Madness and your team either won or lost yesterday. I loved it that uh, ORU pulled out one on Friday and upset. You know, Ohio State. I'm from Ohio and, and my brother's in mourning right now. Um, but do you want to know who's going to win? I can predict who's going to win. Yes. The team who has the most unity. The one that's going to win the final four is the team that when they could take a shot, but their team member has a little bit better opening and they pass the ball. That it's not about me winning. It's not about me being a star. It's about us winning and us winning together. Amen. Now, to help you guys out and to help you guys out at home, we have provided what I call the refrigerator copy of the Family Code of Honor. And so as you're leaving today, these will be passed out to you. You can download them online on the media page where the sermon notes were, was the Family Code of Honor. And you can have these on your wall. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to go over this with your kids. If they weren't in here, walk through this. Here's our family code. And then I want to get husbands and wives, moms and dads, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters to put their signature on this. And then we put it on the refrigerator. And then when somebody's doing a certain behavior, it's like, stop it, stop it. It's like, hey, number five. Hey, let's read number two. Hey, let's, let's remember number eight. And that we pray, we love, we encourage, and we invest in each other. And I encourage you to read this on a regular basis, maybe before or after a family meal. Amen. Will you guys stand up? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask something. Uh, our JV students, if you're not with your parents, if you can see them in the auditorium, would you move over to them? If you have family members around you, would you join hands with them, hug them, put your arm around your husband or wife? And uh, uh, I just want us to pray over you. Father... We pray over these moms and dads, sons and daughters, husbands and wives. We pray over roommates in the name of Jesus. And God, we just pray for relationships to grow, relationships to abound, and relationships to be healed in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for that marriage that has been troubled, that has been, been just, just facing some rough spots. Lord, I pray that the love that was once there will be restored and reignited within their hearts. I pray, Lord, for unity within our families, in our households, that we walk together of one mind, one spirit, and one purpose. And so, Lord, heal our family relationships. Bless each and every home that is represented here. And bless all that they set their hands to. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Before we go, don't leave yet, don't move yet. Just give me 60 seconds. If you've never said, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. The Bible says that you're an outsider, that you're on the outside looking in, that, that God desires a relationship and, and he wants to come in and dine with you and have a relationship with you. And the Bible declares he wants to adopt you as a son or daughter.
You see, we're all orphans. We're orphans in this world and in this life. But God says, I choose you. And I choose you. And I choose you. And he said, I'm a holy God. And you're a sinful person. And I need to fix that. And the way he fixed it is he sent his only son, Jesus, to die on a cross, to be beaten and bruised and crucified and nailed to a wooden cross that by the shedding of his blood that there would be the forgiveness of sins and that his blood would purify us. The Bible says that the the blood of Jesus Christ washes us and makes us white as snow. We had a lot of snow last weekend. We get what being washed white as snow is. But what is God saying? I'm going to make you clean, pure, and holy so I can bring you up and have fellowship and relationship with me. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't come to church long enough. You can't wear out your knees praying enough. All you have to do is say, God, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. God, I want a relationship with you. And that will happen. I'm going to ask you to take that step of faith today. And we want to cheer and celebrate with those who do. Last service, we had three people that said yes to God. How do you say yes to God? We're going to ask you. I'm going to count to three. And if you say, Dean, I need a relationship with God. I'm not where I know I could or should be. And I want today to be my day. I'm going to count to three. You're going to raise your hand high. This place is going to cheer and erupt like you just won March Madness. And then someone will come and pray with you right where you are and lead you in a simple prayer. Those of you that are watching online, that prayer will come on your screen so you too can make a commitment and decision to Jesus Christ. Let's go for it. Let's step out and trust God with our lives. On the count of three, let's go. One, two, three. Shoot that hand up really, really high. Anybody? There's two right there. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else? Is there one more back there? Did I see a hand? Amen, 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 amen. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed the service. If you live here in Colorado Springs or you're going to be in the city, I hope that you'll come and experience the service firsthand. And for those of you that are enjoying the ministry and you're being fed to on a weekly basis, I invite you to partner with us financially and make an investment into the mission and the vision of Rock Family Church. And lastly, if you've never made a commitment and a decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, would you make that decision today? Why wait till tomorrow? Why wait till next weekend? I dare you to pray this prayer with me. Would you close your eyes? Would you pray this prayer with me and repeat it? It goes like this. Pray this with me. Say, dear God, forgive me of all of my sins and mistakes. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And I invite him to be the Lord of my life. Thank you for loving me and forgiving me. My life is now in your hands. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Amen. Hey, thanks for making that commitment. Will you email us at info at rockfamilychurch.com. Tell us about your new decision to stand up big and live strong for Jesus Christ. We'd love to celebrate with you. God bless you guys. We'll see you next weekend.